All right, well, welcome back everyone. We're gonna kick off with session two of our Viz XAI papers today, or explorables actually. And our first presentation is actually gonna be virtual. It's gonna be by Javier Rondo, and he's gonna be talking about how is real world gender bias reflected in language models. And so again, after the presentation, feel free to leave your questions on Slido and we can read them off afterward. Hello everyone, I'm Javier Rando, and I'm here to present our work, How is Real World Gender Bias Reflected in Language Models? If we are here today, it is because artificial intelligence can reproduce social biases in decision-making processes. On the right, you can see a figure of text completion by GPT-3, a very well-known state-of-the-art language model. You've probably realized by now what's going on. And the answer is yes, language models are biased. But the question we want to address in this work is whether this bias is actually aligned with real-world demographics, because unfortunately, real-world does not exhibit parity when it comes to gender, and we train models on real-world data. On the bottom, you can see a figure in which it, each dot represents a profession, and the color represents the percentage of females working as that profession in the United States. On the left, very male-dominated professions. On the right, very female-dominated professions. But wait a moment. How do language models work? In very simple words, language models are some architecture that is trained to predict hidden words in a text. So basically, you take a sentence, you hide some of the words, you replace them by the token mask, and then you ask the model to predict what was the missing word. So then we can use these models to actually fill in the blanks. On the bottom, you can see two examples. On the left, blank is a doctor. On the right, blank is a nurse. Below, you can see the most likely words by, assigned by the model and their respective probabilities. On the left, for the doctor, he is the most likely word to fill in the blank. However, on the right, she is a nurse is the most likely combination. So now, let's see how all this comes together. Professions, real-world demographics, and output probabilities by language models. So let's take the very same example as we saw before. Our sentences, our sentences are going to be of the shape mask, so blank, we want the model to predict the missing word, is a certain profession. So on the scatter plot, we represent on the x-axis the ground truth percentage of females in the real world working in a certain profession, and on the y-axis we are going to represent the probability that the word she actually fills in the given mask. So what we see is that in general, she gets assigned a lower probability than he, because it, like most of the dots are clustered below the 50% threshold, and then, however, there are some professions that get a very high probability for the word she. This cluster here actually represents professions such as nurse, maid, or receptionist, which are also very female dominated in the real world. Here we can see the detail of some examples on how real world data on the left relates to language model predictions on the right. For some of them, they are very well aligned engineer, a very male-dominated profession in the real world, also has a very skewed distribution towards he by the language model. Same happen for nurse, which is a very female-dominated profession. However, there are some other professions, such, a, such as secretary, that we saw that was the most female-dominated profession in the, in the world, that actually the language model thinks he is more likely to fill in this sentence. Now, my colleague Alex is going to present to you how the latent space in these language models behave relating gender and professions. Thank you, Javier. Now, let's have a look at the latent space itself. In the upcoming visualizations, we will represent the contextual embedding of the he pronoun in sentences such as he is a nurse, he is an electrician, etc. by blue crosses, uh, the female pronoun by yellow crosses, and the masks by dots, which are color-coded according to the real-world distribution. We actually had a look at all 13 layers of BERT, and in the first 10 layers we noticed that all masks get placed very close to the he pronoun relative to she pronoun. So that sort of shows us that BERT has a very strong male bias in the first couple of layers. In layer 10 we finally noticed a difference, namely it seems to place a few 
very uh, stereotypically female professions close to the female cluster, such as nurse and housekeeper. This trend continues in layer 11 as well, with professions uh, receptionist and maid. In layer 12, we finally see a big difference. Namely, it seems to become more nuanced and makes no strong assertions about a multitude of professions, which you can here sort of see as dots hovering uh, between the two clusters. However, it still makes strong assertions about stereotypically female professions and stereotypically male professions, such as plumber and electrician. Now, in order to really extract what we care about from these visualizations, namely the placement of the mask relative to the he and she embedding, we came up with the following visualizations. This is for layer 12. On the y-axis, you can see a sample of professions, and uh, the, the closer the dot is to the right, to the she embedding, the closer the mask is to the she embedding relative to the he embedding. Now you can see that for this sample of professions, the placement of the masks more or less resembles the real-world distribution. However, this is not the most interesting thing we saw here. We namely discovered that professions which are associated with cooking, like cook and chef, are assumed to be female by the language model. A prime example of that is the profession cook, which is actually male-dominated in the real world. It is 60% uh, male. Yet, uh, the mask for it is placed very, very close to the she pronoun. So that is certainly interesting. The same also goes for a profession like chef. So what can we conclude from all of this? Well, Bert seems to make uh, predictions which at least partially match the real-world distribution. Bert has a very strong male bias in lower layers and becomes more nuanced in later ones. Even though it is more nuanced in later ones, it still makes very strong assertions about high stereotype professions. At this point, we also want to say that uh, our work is more of an explorative nature, so we highly encourage you to play around with our dashboard, play around with the settings, and come to your own insights. But I think all of this really goes back to one main point, namely that gender, sorry, language models do make strong assumptions about gender. So if you use language models, in uh, safety critical applications, you need to sort of understand what assumptions the language model makes about gender in order to avoid ethical concerns. So thank you very much for listening. Now Javier and myself are very uh, excited to hear your questions. Thank you. All right, well, um, thank you for the presentation. And we have a handful of questions on Slido, so let me uh, uh, ask the first one. One question is just, how did you visualize the latent space? How did you know where to position them on that kind of, uh, in those visualizations? So the question is, how, how do we generate those visualizations, sorry? How did you visualize that the latent space? Okay, so basically we generate these very high-dimensional embeddings for each of the for each of the uh, pronouns on the mask token in the language model, and then we basically feed some UMAP uh, UMAP transformation of this data to bring it down to two dimensions, and then this is the visualization we plot in our in our dashboard. In any case, we also let the user play around with different projections uh, algorithms such as such as PCA and different parameters of UMAP in the in the interactive dashboard. Great, thank you. And another question we have time for is do you have any thoughts about what do we do with these biases once they are discovered? Uh, I guess that's a, that's a very good question, and the answer is quite tough. Um, I don't know, Alex, if you have some thoughts here. Um, yeah, it is indeed quite a difficult question. Um, I think as I said in the presentation, it is just something that people who use language models, they need to be aware of those, uh, of those facts, uh, because otherwise there can be ethical concerns. 
I think it really it really depends on the downstream application and what we want to do with those language models and how this bias at the end of the day may affect people uh, which may be harmed by these decisions language models make and this is when things get especially tricky. Yes. Great. Um, well, again, really exciting work. I'm sorry we don't have time for more questions, but uh, maybe we can follow up with the others on Discord. But uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to move right along to our next uh, paper, which is Explaining Image Classifiers with Wavelets. And this is going to be presented by Julius. Hello, everyone. My name and I'm here today to present you our explorable explanation called Explaining Image Classifiers with Wavelets. Uh, it's a joint work together with Stefan Kulik and Gita Kutinjok here at the Verne AI Chair for Mathematical Foundations of Artificial Intelligence at LME Munich. Uh, this whole thing is based on a paper forthcoming in ECSV next week called Cartoon Explanations of Image Classifiers. Uh, the paper is also co-authored with Duke Anne Nguyen, uh, Professor Ron Levy and Professor Jörn Brunner, but not including me. Um, we had two goals with this explorable explanation. For one, we had always seen other people do these really cool explorables, and we always want to do it ourselves. And since this was, as you're going to see, a really visual work, we thought it was like a good chance to do it. Uh, the second is, as I might give away, it's about wavelets. And we felt like a lot of people working in artificial intelligence and machine learning might not even know what a wavelet is. So we thought this was a good opportunity to try to extend that and maybe even give you like the hard sell for why we think they're really cool. What we're trying to do here is to find an explanation for why a neural network has made a certain decision. The classical case is you've got some sort of neural network f theta, theta being the neural network's parameters, taking in some image x and giving you some sort of label y, what's in the image. But usually this neural network doesn't come with like an automatic way of telling you why it made this decision. So there's lots of different competing methods of this kind of explainability problem. Here we've got one that's kind of a classical one. It's called the mask-based explanation or also the weight distortion explanation. For the weight distortion explanation, you're trying to find a certain mask M that's supposed to exactly find out what the important parts of the images for the decision are. And you define what is important by replacing all the non-important parts that would be represented by a zero in the mask with some random perturbation psi. And if that aren't that important, that shouldn't really impact what the neural network outputs. So you can say roughly nothing changes. This is also where our first explorable part of the explanation comes in, because it turns out this is surprisingly easy to compute on a computer, even without a GPU, if you've got a small enough neural network. So we made like a little game out of it, where you can draw your own mask of images you can choose, and then try to get like the most important parts of the image. Unfortunately, how exactly the wavelet transform works is a little bit of a longer story and I won't be able to do justice here, but roughly you can think of it as a change of basis. So in a regular image, you think of the basis as being the individual pixels, so we've got like multiples of every single pixel, how much color there is. But this is in some sense a very unnatural way to think about things, because in everyday images you don't just have one pixel standing out. So in wavelets, every wavelet is a kind of more meaningful, larger scale pattern that might also encode a certain frequency. So if there's something regular, it can also be easily encoded. The big upside of doing the wavelet transform is the sparsity. So we've made a little game again here, where you can draw a little image on the left. I did my best impression of a tree, and then it calculates a certain kind of wavelet transform on the right. Now you can see that there's just a lot less pixels on the right, so most of the values are just zero. That can, for example, be exploited in image compression, but in this case we use it to find The method itself is explained in some more detail in the explorable explanation itself, but here you can see the end result. So on the left we've got 
uh, Jaguar. And on the right, we've got two explanations of why a certain neural network classified it as such. On the very right, you can see the pixel mask in the middle of the wavelet mask. And hopefully you can kind of see that it's just less pixelated and you can more see the actual pattern, which makes sense because these wavelets can fit these wave-like things very easily. And yeah, uh, with that we're happy to take any questions. All right, thank you. And again, you can feel free to enter your questions on Slido or feel free to come up to the microphone as well. Um, we have one question to kick things off on Slido about, can, can you give us a little bit of information about what's the intuition of using wavelets for this approach as opposed to other techniques that have been tried in the past? Yeah, I mean, I think the main intuition is that the one thing we really have about wavelets is the sparsity. I mean, that's kind of, I feel like, what wavelets are all about. And this weight distortion explanation also really wants sparsity. So we just felt like that was a very natural combination. I mean, you could certainly imagine other combinations as well, where you had to do like a wavelet transform first and then some sort of other explainability method. But like this just felt like a very neat fit, if that makes sense. Another question we have is, is that uh, they really like, as a part of your explorable, that you could, you could kind of draw on the image, perturb the image, and get a prediction. And I guess they were wondering, from someone like you that probably did a lot of these experiments as you were building it, does it often predict the thing that you would expect it to predict, or do you get a lot of variability? Yeah, I mean, I mean first of all, thank you for the questions. Um, yeah, it, it's kind of fun. It feel like it really depends on the neural network. I mean, in this case, we use something called MobileNet from Google. And for some reason, if you just add like random noise, it always says like chain mail. So, I mean, I guess random noise is chain mail. So you get some surprises. I mean, I guess one thing about this tool where you draw your own mask is that it's kind of a very weird way to do it because you've got a very thick kind of stroke. So the kind of usual thing is to just like paint half the image or something. But that's not really what the like optimal things in this like pixel mask where you could have like individual pixels but you can't draw that so it's a, it's a bit weird to draw it and i mean I, to really answer your questions i guess sometimes but it's really inscrutable to be honest yeah that no, makes sense thank you thank you well unfortunately we're out of time for questions but thanks again for a great explorable and, and presentation and uh, again we can follow up on discord with any more questions thank you yeah, thank you so much okay and our last uh, presentation for session two is uh, what should we watch tonight? And Ibrahim will present. Hello everyone, my name is Ibrahim, I'm here to present our work titled What Should We Watch Tonight? Why sometimes your favorite streaming service just cannot manage to recommend anything interesting. Recommender systems are everywhere. Here you can see a couple of examples of where recommender systems can be found in our daily life. We may have a music service that creates playlists or even radio stations just for you a video streaming platform that recommends for us what to watch next, or even social media that use our interaction to suggest new content to consume. Formally, we can define recommender system as a series of techniques that can suggest for a given user new item to interact with. Generally speaking, recommender system are based on two main methods. The first method is called content-based. The main idea behind this method is to find a movie that is similar to the one that the user has already watched. The second one is called collaborative filtering. Here, the idea is to find a movie that two similar users have watched and recommend one of these two users a movie that the other has already seen. Since modern recommender system can be quite complex to understand, we decided to structure our submission as an educational article that starts with a core technique called matrix factorization, on top of which we add more complexity to reach today's state-of-the-art technique. In this way, we guide the user in understanding how modern recommender system works. In a simple scenario, matrix factorization is an easy-to-follow computation that uses a dot product between two matrices user and item to predict the rating for an unseen movie. 
You will find an interactive version of this method in our article. On top of the matrix factorization technique, we add a general bias to illustrate the effect of it on recommender system model. We call it embedding MF. And you can think of it as a simplification of the funk SVD method. Finally, we look into states of the art through a DeepFM implementation. DeepFM includes elements from both previous models. Here you can see the model architecture, which include embedding layer and a factorization machine, all of which come from a single row input. On our way to open the black box and explain how different models recommend the user a new item to interact with, we explore condition of failure across the two models. Through the visualization that you're going to see shortly, we enable the reader to learn what it means when model produce error and under which condition error is highest. Here we can see that all three means are pretty close and the shape of both the models that we have fit, embedding math and DeepFM are quite similar. The plot on the right represents the root mean square error, which enabled the reader to see exactly where the model produced the highest error. In our case, this happens when we try to predict movie with a rating of one or of five. So the two extremes are the rating scale. Why is that? We prepare additional visualization to help the reader uncover this. To do so, we have created a three group Venn diagram. Inside each group region, movie have been encoded as circle. The dimension of the circle reflect the model error in predicting whatever the user likes this movie. The case that is now playing on the screen is based on our example. User Xiao really likes the movie Who's That Curve, but neither of the two models we have tested recommended it. In contrast, both models recommend Xiao, Buffy, the Vampire Slayer, which true value have shown us he didn't like at all. Why did this happen? We have the reader uncover this through deeper exploration of these two recommendations. By using a histogram plot, the reader can at glance understand why the model fails to predict content that Xiao should have enjoyed. We see that Xiao is not part of the dense portion of the population visualized, meaning that most of, of other training user preferences in movie differ from Xiao's. So what we can do to make the experience more personalized? This is the final bit of exploration we do with our readers, and its goal is to establish an intuitive understanding of the current limitation of recommendation technique in the wild. When reading the article, we hope that the reader can understand that while recommender system aims to generalize a personalized experience on the web, in reality, models are trained on a group of users with similar characteristics, not on a single user and their individual opinion. The feature we have used for characterizing user similarity were shown to not be sufficient for making good recommendation. To discover machine recommended content that speaks to us and connects with us on a personal level, we must move beyond a one model fits all user approach. And with this, I conclude. Thank you so much. Here you can see my information and the link to the full article if you're interested in too. And on the right, all of my colleagues with I thanks for the support and I'm ready to take your question. See you. Hi, Ibrahim. Thank you for that presentation. Uh, so one question, that came, one, question that came in, oh, one question that came in is, so what should we watch tonight? So from that, I can infer that, did you find any interesting discoveries by kind of exploring different the recommendations? And um, yeah, how, did that, how was your experience playing with these go? Uh, if I had the perfect answer to this question, I would be a millionaire, I think. Uh, it's very difficult in the sense that the model, as we stated, uh, are trying to categorize multiple users together. And when doing so, your preference gets lost in the complete uh, aggregation. So what you can do is try, as a model developer, what they can do is to try to integrate more information about you. On the other side, as a user, Maybe you don't want to give this data, so let's try to find yourself the best movie to watch. Yeah. Uh, it's very tricky in the end. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, we have another question about how close do the models in this article tell us about how recommendations operate in the wild? Um, the deep learning model that we use is actually uh, a model that 
uh, it's actually uh, used in production, not for movie, but for ads. Uh, so in that case, from the paper that we took the algorithm, seems that worked per fine. Uh, but when we transition to movie, we incorporate this problem uh, about that real preference get lost. Got it. And we have another question. That you kind of made this recommendation that you know it, it probably doesn't make sense to have one recommendation model for everyone, but rather a bunch of ones. And so I guess, do you have any intuition about how would we know how to assign different users to different models? Uh, this is an interesting question. Um, we thought about it. Uh, but we didn't come out with a perfect solution, especially because we can imagine that it's, from a production perspective, it's complicated to have multiple models for each user uh, to have this personalized experience. So maybe I think a mix of both could be the solution. Makes sense. Okay, well again, thank you for the presentation and thanks for joining us today. All right. Thank you so much. All right, yes, thank you. I'm going to hand the moderation duties off to Mena, who will chair the remaining three papers. All right, thanks. So we are transitioning now from a couple of online talks to our um, uh, one in-person talk. So let me introduce um, Evan, who are going to present our second best paper about uh, poisoning attacks. Uh, hi, I'm Evan, and I'm going to be talking about our work on poisoning attacks and subpopulation susceptibility. So first, what is a poisoning attack? Well, if we imagine a prototypical machine learning pipeline, we have some data collection step, and then we have some model training step which uses that training data to train a model to perform some task. Uh, very often, this training data is collected from several untrusted sources. In a poisoning attack, one of these sources uh, is adversarial. And an adversary controlling some fraction of the training data uses that data uh, in order to induce some specific behavior in the trained model, which is unintended by the model developer. So an example of where this is possible is in email spam filtering where perhaps the spam filter is a machine learning classifier which uses real, real emails as training data. A spam author may act as the adversary and attempt to evade the spam filter by injecting their own emails into the training data. And for example, they can set the desired classification label by using a report not spam feature uh, found in their email service. So our work explores visualizations for these kinds of poisoning attacks. Using the spam example, perhaps these data points are emails, and the task of the spam filter is to distinguish between spam emails, which are colored red, and benign emails, which are colored blue. We have a classifier trained on some sample data points, and maybe a spam email author, whose emails are colored orange, wants to evade detection by the classifier. Well, one thing the spam author may do is inject their own emails as training data into the data set. And by doing so, they induce some change in the trained model. And after injecting enough poisoned data points, the poisoned model now behaves differently on uh, the spam author's points. More generally, the emails belonging to the spam author form what we call a subpopulation. And a subpopulation poisoning attack is a poisoning attack with the objective of 
minimizing the or, or hurting the model's performance on the subpopulation while not affecting the model's performance outside of the subpopulation. So in the previous example, we were manually creating all the poison points. We'd like to have a more principled way of conducting these poisoning attacks. And for this purpose, we use the online model targeted poisoning attack developed by Suya et al. Uh, so in a model targeted attack, you break the attack process into two steps. First, you find a target model which achieves the attack objective. So on the left, uh, we can see an example data set with the target subpopulation highlighted in orange. And we see a dashed model, or a, a dashed line, indicating the decision boundary of a model which misclassifies those orange points. In the second step, we find points which induce that target model. So we have a target model in mind, and our poisoning algorithm finds points so that the poisoned model moves closer and closer to the target model. So besides visualizing the poisoning attacks, a goal of our experiments is to understand what makes some poisoning attacks more difficult than others. One way we can do this is by looking at how properties of the data set affect the difficulty of the attack. Uh, so in this visualization, we're looking at uh, different data set properties, different data set parameters, and we're looking at how those data set parameters affect the attack difficulty. Uh, so we have one data set parameter, which is class separation, which controls how far apart the two classes are. And another data set parameter, the random label fraction, which controls how much label noise is exhibited in a data set. What we see is that data sets uh, which are more separable by the clean model, which corresponds to high separation and, and low label noise, experience more difficult poisoning attacks. So uh, perhaps more importantly, we're also interested in what properties of the targeted subpopulation affect attack difficulty. Uh, so here, we have fixed some of the data set properties. So there is reasonable class separation and just a little bit of label noise. Uh, but now we are targeting two different subpopulations. Uh, what we see is that the subpopulation on the left experiences a much more difficult poisoning attack while the subpopulation on the right experiences a much easier poisoning attack. And by looking at these visualizations, we can start to reason about what effects or, or what properties of the subpopulation is actually contributing to these differences in attack difficulty. So for example, on the right, we see that the target model actually does not misclassify very much of the data set outside of the subpopulation. And so in some sense, this subpopulation is much easier to attack because you don't have to find a poisoned model which damages very much outside of the subpopulation. Uh, so all the previous examples have used synthetic data sets, and that is perhaps the, the main focus of our explorable. Uh, but we'd also like to think about how to extend these techniques to higher dimensional data sets. And for that purpose, we can employ dimensionality reduction techniques. So here uh, we have some, so, so this data is the adult data set, uh, which is a US census data set uh, where the data points are people and the attributes contain, contain some demographic information about those people. And the classification task is to determine whether or not an instance makes more than a certain amount of money each year. So by applying the dimensionality reduction, we can uh, view the data points in a lower dimensional space. So originally, these points are 57 dimensional uh, after the data transformations are applied. The dimensionality reduction allows us to view the data points in a lower dimensional space. And then we can actually uh, employ some interesting techniques to actually visualize the behavior of the model uh, in this embedding space. Effectively, what you do is your embedding gives you some embedding map from the high dimensional space to the low dimensional space. We can learn some inverse map, uh, which loosely speaking, you can think of, we're, we're learning a, a coordinate chart onto the manifold on which our data lies. And by querying the classifier's behavior on, a, on the, the image of that coordinate chart, we can illustrate the classifier's behavior in the embedding space. And so we, we get a result which we can interpret in much the same way. 
as the previous examples. Uh, so that's all I have time for. Make sure to check out our article if you're interested in learning more. I'd be happy to take questions. So feel free to come to the microphone if you have any questions in the room, um, and also add questions to Slido. Um, our first question here was upvoted quite a few times. Can you envision an interactive spam filter that explains itself using the visualizations that you presented? Interactive spam filter. Yes, yeah, so, so I, I think that sounds more like a trying to explain the behavior of a model which exists. Uh, there perhaps could be some interesting applications uh, in attempting to uh, maybe explain the confidence of a prediction by examining how introducing new data points changes the, the decision of the classifier. Uh, or, or perhaps you're thinking of like as a, an extension of this work or, or maybe some other direction you could take it. Uh, yeah, that would also be an interesting example. Maybe you could uh, actually uh, create your own email data points, train the classifier, and then see how, uh, if you can provide some interactive environment for explaining those decisions. And, um, the next question is, um, can, could you imagine that the model forgets over time so that it adapts to changes? Can you repeat that? Can you imagine that the model forgets over time? So it adapts to different changes. The model, yeah, I'm not sure if I understand the. Uh, I guess what they mean is like that the model changes over time to be to to some of the points and not something else. Right. So maybe. Yes. Yeah. 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 I'll, I'd be happy to answer that offline. Maybe if you could clarify. Uh, yeah, so, so maybe, maybe there's some, uh, yeah, maybe I could explain what's going on here a bit more. Uh, so we start with the clean data set and then incrementally add points into the data set. And each uh, frame of this animation, we're looking at a different classifier which was trained on all of the points up to that uh, iteration. Uh, and so perhaps the question is like, if we forget about other data points, uh, the behavior of the model changes. I guess that's definitely something you could look at. So thank you again for the presentation. That's all the questions we have time for. There are a couple more on Slido, so feel free to explore them. Thank you. All right, so moving. <laughs> moving to our next speaker. Um, Brandon will be presenting Mapping Wikipedia with BERT and UMAP. The floor is yours. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Brandon. I'm from uh, Nomic AI, and today I'm going to be talking to you about mapping Wikipedia with Burton UMAP. Before we get started, I'd love to shout out the rest of the team behind this visualization. Uh, we've got Andre Moliar, who is a co founder of Nomic, and uh, Ben Schmidt, who's our resident web GPU wizard, uh, who could not be with us uh, here today. Uh, without them, uh, we would not have been able to ship this visualization, so super happy to have them uh, as part of the team. Uh, and then just for a little bit of context, uh, I'm going to say a quick note about Nomic. Uh, we are the world's first information cartography company, and our goal is to enable anyone to interact with massive data sets using AI-powered visualizations in the browser. So uh, that's a little bit about us. Now let's just get into the actual map. Uh, what you're seeing on the screen right now is uh, what we submitted to the conference. Um, it's sort of like this scrolly telling interface, uh, as Ian had mentioned earlier, as one of the strategies for uh, doing sort of narrative structure on visualizations. But to make it a little bit easier to see for the presentation, I'm actually going to swap to uh, this interface, uh, which is uh, sort of just blowing up what's actually on the map. Uh, and I'll make it easier for the audience to see. 
Uh, and even before we get into exploring the map, uh, I want to talk a little bit about why we would even care about mapping something like Wikipedia. Uh, to understand that, we need to step back and make the observation that we've got machine learning models out there in the world in production, having impact in domains like finance and medicine and defense. Uh, and a lot of these models do not have sort of observability tools uh, that are being used to understand how they're making their decisions. Uh, and so we feel like there is this need for uh, these massive visualizations to help people understand uh, the relationships present in the entire data set these things are trained with. Uh, additionally, I think as 21st century citizens, uh, we have this issue where there's all of this data out uh, on the internet available to us and making sense of it with, say, ranked lists coming back from Google uh, is actually quite challenging. Uh, and so if we can imagine interfaces that let us interact with the entire set of data uh, as a whole and see all the relationships at once, uh, that could be a step in uh, sort of rectifying that issue. So getting into what we're seeing on the screen, uh, in order to build this map, uh, essentially what we did is we started with a sort of general purpose language understanding model uh, called BERT. Many of you are probably familiar with it. Essentially, you feed BERT text and out the other end comes a 768-dimensional vector that, in some sense, represents the text. Um, in industry, these vectors often go into lots of downstream systems and are used uh, for doing a bunch of downstream tasks. Um, but for us, what they do is they supply us sort of this semantic representation of a piece of text, in this case, a Wikipedia article. Uh, once we've got those vectors, uh, we need to turn them into a form where people can actually view them. Uh, we are three-dimensional beings, and so we cannot directly view 768-dimensional vectors. Uh, and so to turn them into a two-dimensional map, uh, we employ UMAP, um, which I think has been talked about a little bit today in the last presentation as well. But um, if you go and look at the UMAP paper, uh, what you'll see is a bunch of category theory that is sort of opaque and somewhat challenging to understand. But the intuition of UMAP is actually rather simple once you peel all that away. Uh, if you've got two vectors that are close in the high dimensional space, UMAP tries to construct a low dimensional space, in this case a two dimensional space, such that uh, those vectors remain close. Um, so now that we know what it is exactly that we're looking at, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things that we found in the map and their implications uh, for BERT's representation space. Uh, the first thing I'm going to remark on is color. What you're seeing here are a bunch of like contiguous regions of color. And these colors were actually generated from human annotations on Wikipedia. Uh, so people literally went through and said, OK, these articles down here are, say, people articles, uh, for instance. And these articles over here are, say, song articles, for instance. But I want to emphasize that our model actually didn't have access to these uh, at training or uh, map construction time. So the fact that we see contiguous regions of color indicates to us that the model is rediscovering uh, semantically meaningful concepts to humans, which is sort of a good uh, first check for the fact that this map is actually discovering reasonable structure. If we zoom in to this region of the map over here, this is what I like to call the uh, sort of uh, media corner of the map. If we start down at the bottom, there's sort of this cluster of video games. Uh, and then over here, we get things like television programs. And progressing up, we get to uh, this sort of musical cluster where there is this bifurcation between songs down here and albums up here. This indicates to us, the users, that BERT is actually able to conceptually distinguish between articles about songs and articles about albums, uh, which teaches us something about the representation space of the model. Um, it also turns out what we found is that there's regions of this map uh, that are all sort of one color in the human annotated categories, but that actually sort of correspond to finer grained uh, semantic categories when you really dive into them. So we've got this sort of cluster here that uh, turns out to contain all of the people in Wikipedia. And if you look at some of these peninsulas jutting out of it, what you'll see is that this peninsula has a bunch of actors in it. Um, and then this peninsula over here has a bunch of politicians in it. One question you might ask yourself is, OK, are all of the actors and politicians confined to these two peninsulas? Uh, in reality, this is actually not the case. There are additional peninsulas up here that contain both uh, actors and politicians. However, all of the actors uh, in this peninsula uh, on the other side of the people cluster are actually Indian. And all of, or all of the politicians, rather, I should say, in this cluster are actually Indian. And um, all of the actors in this cluster are actually involved in Bollywood. 
And so what we start to see is BERT has this interesting property where it seems to be binding uh, ethnicity more strongly than it's binding occupation in this instance. Um, we need to be careful when drawing this inference from the map alone because this could be an artifact of UMAP and not of BERT itself. So to double check this, what we did is we went back up into the high dimensional space and we compared BERT's representations of all of the Indian politicians and the Indian actors to the representations of the American politicians and actors. And we did indeed find that uh, in the high dimensional space, BERT considers uh, the articles about Indian actors and Indian politicians to be more similar than the articles about Indian actors and American actors. Uh, this could obviously have some challenging implications for any kind of downstream system that would say take the bio of a person and perhaps try and predict if you should approve them for something like a loan. Um, so that's sort of why we think it's important to try and use these systems to uncover some of these representational biases in these systems. Um, but another thing that we thought was interesting coming out of this map is that we've sort of found that data and a model are sort of two different sides of the same coin. And you can use these maps actually to discover additional structure within your data set. So if we come down into this area of the map, uh, essentially what we find is there is this one colored cluster of a bunch of aircraft. Um, and it's surrounded by a couple of other clusters that are all colored blue, which is sort of the et cetera category. Um, so it's sort of lumped together of all of the things that weren't in the top 100 categories of Wikipedia. And it turns out that this cluster here uh, actually consists of a bunch of cars. And this cluster down here actually consists of a bunch of locomotives. And so from this, uh, we can sort of determine if we wanted to build a finer grain taxonomy of things on Wikipedia, uh, we would likely want to introduce uh, labels for these sorts of things. So uh, that is just sort of a quick overview of some of the things that we found using this map. And in keeping with our goal of trying to make these things as accessible as possible, I want to mention that we are actually launching a beta where you can just download a Python client, shoot text at it, and out the other end, you will get a map that looks like this with all the interactivity. So if you're interested in that, uh, go visit nomic.ai. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions? All right, so let me start off by um, a question here about uh, UMAP. So there's a lot of questions about how did you choose the parameters of UMAP, which layer of BERT did you use, um, and so on. So could you give us a little bit more insight into these choices? Yeah, absolutely. Wow, that was loud. Um, so uh, in the full article, we actually have a massive section down here where we talk about sort of the specifics. Um, one of the things that we did in terms of which parameters we used is we used the CLS token, uh, which was trained with the next sentence prediction objective. Uh, and we actually also talk a little bit about uh, in the article why we think that contributes to this sort of like ethnicity versus occupation binding uh, pathology. In terms of UMAP, uh, we use something like, let's see how many neighbors, 30 neighbors, min dist of 0.1, and then we trained it. I think these are the defaults uh, in, in UMAP, but in the, uh, in the Python client, you can sort of configure these things for yourself um, so you can uh, sort of customize what you want to come out the other side. Right, and then uh, we have a question here about um, whether you only use in the English language in Wikipedia or uh, other languages. Did you consider other cultural issues? Yeah, so we only used uh, the English portion of Wikipedia, and we actually, uh, again, sort of like in this, in, in our full article, we talk a little bit about the fact that uh, you might have uh, certain populations that are underrepresented in English Wikipedia that contribute to some of these binding issues. So it turns out when you have more uh, sort of American actors than um, Indian people, we think, in, a, uh, in, in the data set, uh, you might actually get this sort of like binding pathology that we see here. Uh, we would love to extend this to other languages and we're working on it now. One of the interesting sort of challenges for us is when we look at multilingual versions of these plots, we often see that the highest level of clustering structure is language. And so we're interested in thinking about how to sort of disambiguate um, language as one of these sort of like clustering confounders so that uh, different languages talking about the same topic might be closer in the map. So I'll take one last question, and um, it's about the dimensionality reduction. Do you think, like, by reducing this whole mass of data set to two dimensions, are you hiding some clusters that might be interesting to explore? Yeah, that's probably true. I mean, we are almost certainly losing information here. Uh, we've got the advantage that the amount of information contained in each subsequent dimension of these plots is generally like a power law. So we're sort of doing the best we can. Um, 
it is unfortunate that humans can't like perceive uh, more than a couple dimensions uh, because we would like to get all of it. But certainly there are things that are being hidden. And this is why I want to emphasize you need to sort of go back up into the ambient space, uh, sort of like we did uh, for the ethnicity versus occupation example, to double check the intuitions you get from this map because it could just be an artifact of the projection. Oh, great, thank you. So we have like more than 10 questions on Slido that we didn't get to. So I encourage you to go to Discord and maybe chat with the people who are interested in that. So yeah. if you have questions, you can also like tweet us at nomic underscore AI and we'll just like answer them there. So that's probably the best way to reach us. Okay, great. Uh, let's thank Brandon again. <laughs> All right. And uh, our last talk for the session is um, an, a hybrid talk about uh, the uh, inter interactive introduction to causal inference, and it will be given by Lucius. Causal inference techniques have long been pervasive in research and have become increasingly important in many fields. From machine learning, to public health. As more and more people and researchers use causal inference, educational material that explains foundational causal inference concepts in an accessible way becomes more and more important. This project aims to help fill that gap by providing a deep dive into the foundations of causal inference in the style of an interactive story. Why interactive? Causal modeling is often about imagining and modeling actions or interventions in some kind of system. A central component of interactive visualizations is the ability to intervene in some system and then immediately see what happens as a result, making them a great tool to demonstrate causal inference concepts. Here we demonstrate a nonlinear causal relationship between two variables, x and y. How does a causal graphical model correspond to structural equations? What happens if we change the parameters in those equations? What do the data look like? We can help build intuition to answer questions like these through interactive widgets, like this one. We start our interactive story with our two main characters. Let's give them each a name and choose their avatars. To connect myself to the narrative, I'll name my researcher Lucius, and I'll call the omniscient being Oracle, but with a different avatar. Lucius now plays the role of the researcher, asking causal questions and attempting to answer them from data. Oracle plays the role of an omniscient being who knows the true answers to all our causal questions and can always simulate the true data generating process. We ground our story around a now classic question in causal inference. Does childcare improve cognitive outcomes for kids? How would Lucius go about answering such a question? To understand this process, We'll need to understand statistical tools and techniques like randomization, explained in this widget, where we can see covariate balance across various probabilities of treatment. We'll use randomization to make a treatment group and a control group, ultimately estimating our sample average treatment effect, or SATE, by comparing those two groups. To see what's really going on, we dive into the omniscient perspective of Oracle to explore sampling distributions, where our choices about estimators can lead to statistical bias, shifting our sampling distribution away from where we want it to be. For example, if we try to use the max to estimate the mean. We explore regression and its helpful properties for estimating differences in means. We also introduce causal graphical models, surfacing the relationships between variables and our assumptions about them. By the end of our story, 
users can explore different modeling scenarios and their corresponding causal graphical models, whether that's a mediator, a collider, or a confounder. And we can change the model's parameters and see what a corresponding automatically created data generating process might look like in mathematical notation. We can look at data tables, showing the counterfactual outcomes that would in practice be visible only to Oracle. And we can look at corresponding covariant plots. For each setting, we can think about how we would use regression to estimate the state and simulate making different choices about which covariates to include in a regression. In this case, we see that in order to get an unbiased estimate of the state, we have to include the confounder x in our regression, centering our sampling distribution on the true value. If not, just like before, we end up with bias. By the end of our story, we hope you'll be able to use this playground to build your own intuition about causal inference and start on your journey to answering causal questions of your own. Causal inference techniques have long been pervasive. So um, let me start this off with uh, a fun question. So how did you make all of these amazing graphical cartoons is one of the questions. <laughs> Can you hear me on Zoom? All right, so the question is, how did you make all of these amazing graphical cartoons? I, I heard the question. Can you hear me coming through on Zoom? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Great. Uh, that's one of my co-authors, Fala Ari oh. Khan at NYU, did all of the all of the graphics. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. So uh, the next question is: Can your approach explain all types of causal inference models? Um, so I guess causal inference models can be. There's sort of a wide variety of things you could call a causal inference model. Um, our underlying visualization um, sort of software does allow you to specify a graph and sort of automatically generate data. So in theory, that could be extended to larger graphs with more nodes and different data generating processes. Uh, but for the sake of sort of demonstration and like a pedagogical choice, we only have uh, three nodes at a time at the, at the end of the article. Okay, great. And I guess the last question we have is also about pedagogy and like, how do you guide the readers through all of these parameters? Yeah, so the, the visualization shown at the end there with tons of sliders and different parameters going on is sort of what you encounter at the very end of a long article. Uh, and along the way, more and more parameters and sliders are introduced in smaller widgets. So by the time you get to the last one, um, hopefully you're more familiar with that number of parameters and have a little more intuition about how they all work. Oh, great, thank you so much. So let's thank, thank Lucius you. and all the speakers again. All right, and that brings us to the end of uh, this XAI. So I want to thank all of the authors, um, our keynote speaker, all of the PC members and all of you for attending. So thank you so much and that's it for the fifth edition of VisXAI.